Hey everybody, uh, Mr. Stone here. So um, this is our last lesson on electromagnetism. And um, it's a pretty heavy one and it's, it's a lot of big ideas here. And unfortunately we really can't dive into them because we're, we're not quite there for the math yet. Uh, we need to be able to do some, some vector calculus and some integral calculus to really understand this. But I'm gonna do my best here to give you um, sort of an overview of some of these big ideas and, and to give you a sense of of the big idea for um, for electromagnetism in terms of the the, the symmetry um, the complementarity and, and sort of the, the unification of these these big ideas um, electromagnetism is definitely in my opinion the the crowning achievement of 19th century physics um, using the the math of that they were figuring out at the time, uh, and they they were able to come up with these equations to completely explain um, classical electromagnetism. Okay, it's it they're they're beautifully created. We call them Maxwell's equations. That's going to be our last slide. When we get to Maxwell's equations. It's going to be kind of scary looking, but we'll get there. Okay, so um, we still have to talk. We we covered a bunch of them, but really haven't talked about them explicitly. Uh, so we're, we're trying to wrap up all of electromagnetism as best we can, um, considering we're in grade 12, okay? Uh, hopefully you guys uh, keep going and end up in university and look at electromagnetism with you know some more math skills involved, and you get to see some of these ideas and, and you can build on them and flesh them out a little bit better. But but here we're gonna try to, try to give you a sense of, of what, what's happening here, okay? So um, we've talked about this a little bit. Uh, electricity and magnetism uh, used to be thought of as, as separate things, right? Uh, and we really talked about them a lot as you know, grade in elementary school and things like that. Um, magnets are quite separate from electricity. Uh, but the big unifying idea of 19th century physics was that electricity and magnetism are one thing. There's only one law which we call electromagnetism now. And and there's some sort of interlinking between them. And uh, the two that we want to talk about here are what we call Ampere's Law and Faraday's Law. Uh, Ampere's Law tries to look at how do currents create magnetic fields, and Faraday's Law tries to talk about how magnetic fields create currents. Um, notice the symmetry in, in, in that and the sort of complementarity that one creates the other and vice versa. Okay. Uh, and this will actually have quite important implications in our next unit on light. Um, the equations of, of Maxwell, Maxwell's equations, really are a wave equation. Okay, uh, and we'll, we'll see that a little bit later. But um, let's start off here with Ampere's law. So first step, let's consider we have uh, we have a uniform magnetic field. Okay, and just to make our lives easier, I've drawn a plane. And we have these little X's that represent the magnetic field going down. Now remember that, that this means that we're looking at the back end of them. So the, we have this nice uniform magnetic field, this B field, all facing down with all these arrows. Let's get rid of these arrows now, just for simplicity's sake, just so we can see them. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a closed loop through this magnetic field. Okay. Now the shape of that loop is arbitrary, as long as it's closed meaning it comes back onto itself, okay? So the orientation of the loop really doesn't matter either, as long as we have this closed loop through this magnetic field, right? Now, if I take that loop and I break it up into tiny little segments, okay, we're gonna call them delta L. We're gonna break them up into tiny little pieces, all right? Now, this is complicated, so I'll go through this slowly, okay? The sum of the products of all components of the magnetic field parallel to L. Okay, so if we consider uh, looking on this picture here, if we have these this magnetic field uh, going down like this, right? We only care about the component that is parallel to this line segment here. Okay, so if our magnetic field is like this, we're only looking at the component in the parallel direction. Okay, 
So uh, if we consider then a little line segment at the top, there is no parallel component, right? Because that, that field, the magnetic field there will be perpendicular to that. So that portion doesn't actually add to it, okay? So we're gonna take all those little pieces and we're gonna take all the, the magnetic field, the component of the magnetic fields parallel to those little pieces. We're gonna multiply them and then add them all up along the whole loop. That's what this little symbol here means. This is Greek capital S, that's the sum. So we're gonna add up all those components of the magnetic field times the length of that piece and add them all up. And that is equal to the current that passes through that area. Okay, we call that the flux. Okay, so this is the, the amount of current that is passing through that area has to be equal to the sum of all that, all those little pieces. And now the direction of that, that's our right hand rule. So our magnetic fields are facing down, so our thumb points to the to the left in this case. So all of our, our current is flowing through that area to the left. Now that's incredibly abstract and um, difficult to understand without, you know, like really what we want to do, looking at this equation, this equation is not very uh, satisfactory. What you want to do is you want to then go to infinitesimally small delta L's, DL's, and then go to a continuous sum, which is what we call an integral, which is basically integral calculus, that scary stuff, okay? So really we want to turn this into a, a, an integral later, but you need integral calculus and hopefully you'll get there eventually. But um, at this point, we can only say that. So, and again, this is very um, abstract, okay? And I understand that. Uh, maybe you wanna pause here and go back and, and listen to me explain it again. Uh, or maybe we can look at an example that'll actually help us understand this a little bit better, okay? So uh, before we go on though, uh, just a nice slide here. This is what we mean by uh, Ampere's law. Again, the sum of all those components parallel to the little delta L's multiplied by the delta L's themselves, add them all up, uh, is equal or proportional to the current. And it's proportional by this mu naught, which we saw the, as last year when we looked at solenoids. This is the permeability of free space. It basically allows us to um, it basically allows us to look at what how, how magnetic fields flow through space, the sort of resistance of the vacuum to magnetic fields, okay? And it's equal to four pi times 10 to the negative seven tesla meters per amp, okay? Seems like a strange unit, but uh, it helps us. If you notice here, we got uh, teslas and meters and we wanna end up with amps. So the proportionality constant has to be in tesla meters per amp, okay? Um, now this is only for vacuum. Um, hopefully you remember maybe in grade 11 when we were playing with solenoids, if I put an uh, iron core inside of the solenoid, remember solenoid is a big coil of wire, if you put an iron core into there, uh, the magnetic field generated by that electromagnet is much stronger uh, because the permeability is much higher than 10 to the negative 7. Okay? Uh, so let's look at an example to, to maybe make this a bit more sense um, and go to an, a thing that we've seen already. Okay, so a wire. What is the magnetic field generated by a wire? Okay, so let's consider a straight wire carrying current I. And for us now, the, the arbitrary path that we're gonna choose is gonna be a circle of radius R. And you'll see why this makes sense. We're gonna choose our, our, um, our path that we're gonna to analyze as a circle around this, this, this current. And hopefully if you remember uh, your grade 11 physics, uh, you, you know why already, okay? So uh, let's start with Ampere's Law. This is our expression we have already, okay? No worries there. Now we know that the magnetic field around a current is gonna go around in these loops, in these circles. And those circles are spherically, or sorry, cylindrically symmetric around that wire, they go in, sorry, cylindrically symmetric. They go in, in circles, okay? So that means that the magnitude of the B field is always gonna be constant. That component, that, that, um, that parallel component will always be parallel to, to B. So it's just is the B field. 
We don't have to worry about the component. There is no perpendicular component. Okay, there is no perpendicular component to the magnetic field generated by that current. It's only around in a circle, a, 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 a true circle. Okay, so in the expression now we don't have to worry about that. We can just say it's b. It's equal to b, right? Um, and since they're all b's, and we have this sum where they all have the same b factor, we can just factor it out of the sum, right? Because really this is saying b times l1 plus b times l2 plus b times l3. L4, all those little tiny little pieces that we can break this up into. But they all have, they're all multiplied by the same magnetic field. So let's just factor it out of the sum. Right? So that's what this is saying. This B now comes out of the sum. So now we're looking at the sum of all the L's. What's the sum of all the components of a circle? Just 2 pi r, the circumference of the circle. And then quite simply, we can solve for B. And we now have an expression for the magnetic field around a wire. It's uniform around that in that circle. It's proportional to the current. Uh, that makes sense. The higher the current, the more magnetic field you have. And it drops off at 1 over r. That's something new. We haven't seen that yet. But when we, we talked about the, remember, using our right hand rule that we can, thumb goes in the direction of the current, and right, we close our fist in the direction of the magnetic field. So we knew the direction, but we never actually talked about the magnitude. So the magnitude is now proportional to 1 over r. As you go away from this, as 1 over r, well, our magnetic field goes down as a reciprocal. Okay? That's function b is a function of r. Okay? And we know that it's, it's going around in these loops. Right? So really, we can add arrows here and say that's our b field. Okay? Oh, isn't that a nice little, uh, nice little expression we have? And actually, it works out nicely because watch, watch this. Let's do an example. So let's say we have a magnetic field of, um, sorry, what is the magnetic field of five hundred thousand Teslas? Okay. Yeah. So let's say I have three hundred thousand amps of current flowing through a wire. Okay, 300,000 amps of current. Somehow we get a thick enough wire, right? Because a regular wire would just burn right out. But so we have a, a, a large enough wire to, to have 300,000 amps of current through it. And we're going to stand 15 centimeters away. What sort of magnetic field would be generated? Okay, so we have our formula that we just developed. Sorry, where are we? Oh, we have to go all the way through this. Silly me. Okay, so B is equal to mu i all over 2 pi r so mu was 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meters per amp multiplied by oh my goodness 3.0 10 to the 5 amps and 2 pi times 0 0.1 Five meters. Okay, and that ends up working out to uh, only 0 0.40 Teslas. Okay, so um, even that much current on one wire actually doesn't generate that much current. That's why we wrap them all up into you know hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of of turns uh, to generate a solenoid. So we add up all that current, but one wire doesn't actually end up generating that much uh, magnetic field. Remember, one Tesla is a lot. Um, if you look at a um, an NMR machine, those huge magnets, that's at maximum something like three Teslas. So, so 0.4 Teslas is a, is a substantial amount, but to generate it, we're going to need an incredible amount of current. All right, let's try another one. Let's, we talked about solenoids. What happens in a solenoid? So here I've, I'm, I'm doing the same idea, but instead of the one wire, I'm taking that wire and looping it around and around and around um, n times over a distance of L. Okay? So again, uh, now if we simplify this, uh, noticing where the current is going here, notice at this point here it's going down the wire, so this is going into the page, and then out of the page. So into the page, 
out of the page. So I can simplify my diagram here by showing a whole collection. This is where the wire goes in and out, and in and out, and in and out. It's just looping around and around and around, n times, let's say. And it's going to generate a magnetic field in this direction. Okay, uh, following our our um, our right hand rule, right? We our fingers are going to wrap around with the solenoid, with the solenoid, and our thumb sticks out in the direction of B. So, what's my arbitrary um, surface, or sorry, arbitrary a path that I'm going to generate here? I'm going to generate a rectangular path around just one side of the solenoid. Okay, just one piece of the solenoid and generate this rectangular path. What's the point of that? Remember, it has to be a closed path, but it's arbitrary. Why did I choose this one in this case? Well, because the magnetic field pretty much doesn't exist outside of the, uh, the coil. Okay? The magnetic field is only inside because it's wrapped around a whole bunch of times, and then we, we're concentrating the magnetic field inside. Outside of it, pretty much negligible. Uh, and along the sides, it doesn't matter because that's at right angles to the B, right? We said in our equation that the only piece that matters is the one that's parallel. So anything perpendicular will not contribute to the current, or sorry, the magnetic field, okay? So the only part that actually matters is that little piece that's actually inside the solenoid that's L meters long, right? That's the only portion that matters the way that we generated that, that path, okay? So again, start off with Ampere's Law. No worries there. Um, so again, turns out that the magnetic field is uniform throughout there. So we can just factor it again out of our, out of our sum. And the current will be equal to the total current, right? All the current going through there. So in this picture here, for example, it's six times the current in the wire because there's six wires. So if there's n turns in our solenoid, there'll be n times i, which will give me the total current, which is basically this. And again, uh, the sum of all the pieces of L basically is just all of L, right? The whole length of my, my solenoid. And look at that. That's our grade 11 formula that we, we had for the um, amount of magnetic field generated by a solenoid, right? So here, now we've actually been able to derive that equation that we saw. And again, it's proportional to the amount of current. We increase the current, we increase the magnetic field, and we increase the number of turns, we also increase the magnetic field. All right? Look at that. So now we've been able to take our, our new understanding of uh, electromagnetism and apply it to get a result from last year that I just gave you. Awesome. So let's just do it again. A quick little problem here. So let's say we have a magnetic... Uh, what's the magnetic field in a solenoid carrying a current of 10 amps? It consists of 400 turns over a length of 20 centimeters. So again, B, you guys use this in the lab, I hope. Wow, that is an impressively bad B. Okay, B is equal to mu. I'm going to use mu naught in this case because we're assuming that there's a, uh, uh, we're assuming that this is a, um, sorry, assuming there's a, there's a vacuum in there. So N. Oops, that's not an N. N I over L. So again, 4 pi, 10 to the negative 7. Oops. Tesla meters per amp. Uh, 400. I is 10 amps. And we're all dividing this by... 0 0.20 meters. It's ending up giving us uh, 0 0.025 Teslas or 25 milliteslas. Okay. Uh, and I was able to use uh, two significant digits because this 400 has these zeros are, are significant because we, this isn't a measurement, it's how many turns, right? It's an integer. And this 20, we're assuming that has two, and 10, they're assuming that has two, so let's go to two significant fix. Okay, uh, so 10 amps, which is a significant amount of current, um, in a solenoid, only generates now uh, 25 millitesels here, because we multiplied by, again, we multiplied by that, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, number of turns. Okay? So, hopefully, um, hopefully Ampere's Law here didn't scare you too much, but it's a, it's a way that we can use to, to come up with all these equations that we saw already. Uh, so let's go on now to Faraday's Law. So Faraday's Law is just sort of a backwards version, right? So it says that a magnetic field changing as a function of time induces a current. So if I change a magnetic field, if I move a magnetic field, if I take a magnet and move it around, I'm actually generating a current at right angles. Um, so the direction of the current is such that the magnetic field, it produces, opposes the change that produced it. Let's unpack that. That's, that's a lot here. Um, so this is called Lenz's Law, and it, it ends up actually being a conservation of energy problem. So the energy gained by the current, so because I'm starting to increase the kinetic energy of the electrons generated current is the energy lost by the magnet. The new magnetic field that's produced fights the original one. Now this okay that's that's a lot. Let's let's, let's look at an example here. So let's take um in this video here I have um, a big chunk of iron, of copper. It's a conductor, a good conductor, and there's a hole in it. And uh, copper is not conductive, uh, it's not magnetic, so it will not stick. But if you drop it down the hole, it very, very slowly falls. So gravity is pulling it down, but there has to be another force that's fighting it. Okay, there has to be something that's slowing it down. That is an incredibly slow path. And the reason it does this is because of Lenz's law. Here you can see the magnet actually very slow. It's not hitting the sides, it's not a friction problem. It's some sort of electromagnetic problem, okay? So as my magnet is moving down, as the field itself, as those field lines are moving down, it's fighting it. So what's actually happening here? Let's get rid of those field lines for a second to, to help us understand. Now, we said that Lenz's law states that the magnetic field that is generated, sorry, yeah, the current that is generated by the magnetic field has to create a new magnetic field that opposes the original one. So if the, in this case, uh, let's assume a cylindrical copper conductor here. This is going to generate a current going around it. We call this an eddy current. It's not a particularly useful current. It's not being used to light a light bulb or something. It's just making electrons go around in a circle. But since they are going around in a circle, we know from uh, Ampere's law that this is going to generate a, new, a, a magnetic field. And applying re uh, the right hand rule, it's going to generate a magnetic field that fights that original magnetic field generated by the magnet. Okay, So the moving magnetic field so that's the, the magnet itself going up and down, induces induction. Remember, we talked about we talked about induction a little bit in grade nine, but not really much. Uh, this induces a current in the tube that generates a new magnetic field that opposes the original moving magnetic field. Okay, so this new magnetic field that we make in that piece of copper that using that eddy current, notice the right hand rule generates a magnetic field going upwards where the magnetic field is going downwards. And this actually does make sense from a energy perspective. So when when we accelerate these electrons to go around in this loop, we're giving them kinetic energy. Uh, a conductor is nice because it's a bunch of protons and stuff that are some sort of atoms that don't really hold on to their electrons very well. So it's very easy to move them. So this magnetic field takes these electrons and starts spinning them in a circle. But for us to, to generate that initial kinetic energy, it has to come from somewhere. Right? We can't just have electrons start moving out of nowhere. We have to do the accounting, do the energy accounting. And where that energy comes from is from the kinetic energy of the, the magnet. So it slows down. Okay. So we're reducing the speed of the magnet going down by increasing the speed of the electrons going around, or vice versa, whichever way you want to look at it. Remember, frames of reference don't matter, all right, because every frame of reference is correct. 
for us in our nice uh, slow lab frames. Uh, but that moving magnet, so again, now, I'd like you to think about this from the point of view, not in the rest frame of the copper pipe, right? Because that's what we're saying. We're saying that the magnet is moving. What is the opposite situation where the magnet is stationary and the copper pipe is moving? How does that change our, our, our system? Right, that's actually a really interesting question. I'd like you to think about that, okay? So right now we're talking about the, if we go back here, we're talking about the frame of reference where the cylinder is um, stationary. What happens when the magnet is stationary? And that's a, that's a, that's a big idea. Let you think about that for a minute, okay? So that's that's basically Faraday's law. And uh, what's nice about Faraday's law is, is this is where we get all of our electricity, basically. Uh, we take a magnet and we spin it. Uh, sorry, we take a electric, we take a coil, some, some conductor, and we spin it in a magnetic field. Right, we take some magnets, put a, a coil, a wire in it, spin it rapidly, and electricity is produced in that coil. Okay, so we have a, st a static. That's how that's how generators work. We have a north on one side, a south on the other side. You take a loop of wire, and you start spinning it around. And that is going to end up generating a current in that wire. And we can then take that current. That's where all of our electricity comes from. Right? You, you just have to some way of, of spinning the uh, have to have some way of spinning the, the coil, whether it's a you know water down a, a waterfall or a steam in a nuclear power plant or something like that. It's, somehow you can generate that spinning. We can generate a a dynamo, an a electrical generator. Okay. So now this is this is the scary bit. Okay, so um, let's put all of electromagnetism together on one slide. Okay, one slide here. This is this is one slide to to, to explain it all. So they look they look really scary, but they're not. Okay, uh, the first one is basically how we generate electric fields. Remember, we put charges in space and we generated these lines going outwards or inwards. That's all that that equation states. It says, in, as a translation, sorry, one second, uh, that a charged object generates an electric field that goes in or out. Right? So that, that expression here, this, this scary thing here, it just says that if we have a charged object, it's going to make an electric field. Okay, it's going to have an electric field either if it's positive, it's going to have an electric field going outwards. If it's negative, it's going to have an electric field going inwards. That's all it says. Okay, uh, the, the second one's even easier. It says that magnetic field lines only travel in closed loops. Okay? The divergence is zero. The fancy pants way of saying that. Excuse me. But it says magnetic fields travel in closed loops. And then the other two are a little bit more complicated, but it's basically what we just went over. So uh, if you change a magnetic field, it generates an electric field at right angles to it. And if you change an electric field, it generates uh, I'm sorry, if you're changing electric fields, generate magnetic fields at right angles to the electric field. And we end up actually producing electric currents. So these two are actually uh, sort of symmetric. And there are fancy ways uh, using relativity that you can actually make them into one, uh, two simple equations. Um, way beyond this class. Okay, way beyond this class. Um, but, but really, these are two uh, sort of two sides of the same coin uh, that generate light okay we're going to talk about this next unit but the symmetry of that actually generates electromagnetic radiation but it can also be used in all of our circuit analysis and everything that we've done here so um, i'm aware that these are these you don't understand the math i'm not trying to scare you okay i'm not trying to 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 throw these what looks like you know alien language at you um but i just want you to give you a a, a kind of overview of the sort of the beauty of our understanding of classical electrodynamics. Um, everything boils down to these four equations. Okay, and that, that generates everything you need to know about electricity and magnetism or electromagnetism. Okay? And they are beautifully symmetric 
and they I, they're the crowning achievement as I said at the beginning of the lesson of um, 19th century physics in my opinion okay don't worry about the math all you have to look at is is what it means um, and you know all of it right now we, we learned this at the very beginning of the unit that if we have a charged object it produces an electric field uh, you learned this in grade 11 that magnetic field lines travel in loops and these two are basically opposite each other if you change a magnetic field it makes an electric field change an electric field it's a you got a magnetic field this little weird this cross product between this just to give you a quick um, quick overview this this del this upside down delta is basically a vector of differential operators so if now okay people who haven't done calculus just turn it off now okay bye okay but I'm, I'm just gonna quickly <laughs> quickly just say okay so this del operator is actually a a partial derivative um, vector. Sorry. So basically, it's just a vector made up of these partial derivatives, which is basically just a derivative with respect to x, derivative with respect to y, derivative with respect to z. So basically, it acts as like a vector, these three different elements. And then we're taking the cross product uh, with the electric field. And this electric field, right, we can, in this case, would be like, uh, sorry. There's some x component, some y component, and some z component. So it itself is a vector, and we're taking the cross product of that. So the cross product of that generates the time derivative, the negative time derivative, negative here. This is Lenz's law that the magnetic field generated opposing it. Um, but don't worry about that. But this is the time derivative of the magnetic field is equal to the cross product of that nonsense. And all you need to know about that is that this is this these two words here that it makes it at a right angle. Okay. So again, don't be too scared. You don't need to know the math. You just need to know what it means. Okay. And we will revisit this these these ideas um, when we look at light as to why light is a wave. This these two equations actually generate a a wave equation. Right? There, there, there's a wave solution to these are two differential equations that have a wave solution. And the wave solution is actually tells us that this is frightening, that the speed of light is actually equal to one over the square root of the permeability multiplied by the permittivity. Since you get a wave equation from these things, see I'm just they're absolutely beautiful. They are there's so much hiding in there, okay? And hopefully at some point, oh, you can't even see that. I'm so sorry. Let's put that up here, that this is telling us here that the speed of light is gonna be equal to one divided by the square root of the permeability times the, per times the uh, permittivity, okay? So, um, not the most, uh, not the most uh, satisfactory lesson because it, it feels as though I'm, I'm cheating you. I'm just basically giving you this stuff. You don't really have the math behind it, but um, hopefully this kind of gives you some sort of a, a glimpse, just a glimpse at what we can do with with these this idea of electromagnetism, okay? So um, let's go back to something a little bit simpler. These are just using those equations that we've generated for uh, magnetic fields using Ampere's law. Uh, so calculate these these Solve these problems. Uh, number nine is kind of interesting. You gotta look at you use gravity a little bit. Here's the component of gravity. So we wanna make these uh, two wires uh, balance at an angle of 12 degrees. So that'll be a fun one. And then some uh, some Faraday's law problems. Uh, number 12 is how does an electric guitar work? Basically, how does how do we induce a current that we can then amplify using an amplifier using uh, a pickup? On um, in this case, it looks like a Fender Stratocaster. Okay. So uh, play with these and uh, have some fun. And uh, again, hope you're all safe. Um, miss you all, and uh, I'll be seeing you soon.